Hello, wrestling friends. I'm Matt Coon, and this is the Gentleman Villain Podcast with the Lordship himself, the head of the Blackpool Combat Club, Mr. William Regal. How are you doing today, Mr. Regal? Wonderful, Matt. How are you? Well, um, saying I'm uh, wonderful. <laughs> Over a, my life, it's, it's in, in a couple of days, it's my 36th anniversary. Wow. Since I got married. Over at my wife on the phone with my mother in law today, she's not doing so well. She had to it's go to the really. doctors the other day. The doctor said strip off. She's got a bit of lettuce sticking out the top of her underwear, my mother in law. The doctor said, that looks nasty. She said, oh, that's nothing. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There we go. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, we're off to a good one. Here we go. That, that is all, the, all these old jokes are not, they're not, not, not mine. I've stolen them off other old, old British comics, but. For the 26 people that listen to this podcast, 25 of them have never heard them before. So there, there we go. The 25 are having a good time. <laughs> and I'm telling you what, much, many, many, many more than 25 listened to our podcast a couple weeks ago. Of course, it's the first time we're taping since we did the episode on MJF. Oh, and yeah. a lot of reaction to the MJF. I got a little reaction I might not have wanted to get. Um, but, you know, uh, maybe you got a phone call or two I didn't want to get. But there was a lot. Or two. See, uh, nobody babies. ever says anything to me. Yeah, it, 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 people are afraid of you. Uh, <laughs> people, but but the 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 listeners, and and actually all those news sites that you you hold so dear to your your yourself, uh, they all loved that episode. They loved seeing the reality of how you felt about it, the passion that you talked about it, and mm. really just the entire story of. Um, the MJF uh, William Regal relationship. Uh, were you surprised by the reaction to it? Did you see the reaction to it? No, of course I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was a hard show for you too. That's why. That's why. That's why it's me. Because it's I, you know I I, I just uh, that, no. I, I, if you start, it, that might lead to a, a lot of things today. But if you start buying into your own nonsense, it can be a, a slippery slope. If you start, you know, we've talked about this on this podcast before. I've never needed, I've always had a, a, an incredible support system in this job from really talented people who, who were far better than me from being a very young age. So they're the people I listen to. I, it, it, too many voices. Are, and you can't, if you don't know or don't have that support system or you, you've got to look to the world to, to see what's going on about yourself, I don't need to. I've, there's always somebody who I think knows better than me or is better than me who will tell me if I'm doing something right or wrong. And so I keep that because too many voices in, in any, any line of work or any, I see it in wrestling, too many opinions, it just messes with your head. And you, when you need to be concentrating on getting good at yourself and getting good at your job or doing the training you're supposed to be doing or, or worrying about what somebody you've never met thinks about you it, it's just stuff that i from a young age have been fortunate enough not to have affect me so i don't expect it, it's very easy for me to say that when I mean, we've said this before i'm not envious of anybody i'm not jealous of anybody i've uh, you know i've got i do my job and i've been fortunate to be born in the right time where i had great people the best possible wrestlers um in in britain then in europe then and different parts of the world and then come to america and have the best wrestlers from then on it, it, that were in wcw when i first got here and me knowing that they were th the real deal and them giving me advice and so i've never i, I keep all that stuff out because otherwise I, it's just gonna mess with my head or get you know if if Sometimes I hear things or somebody tell, you know, cause you've got, you know, how it is, people always want to tell you stuff. Somebody starts telling me something that somebody said something about me. Then if it's about the character or about William Regal doing, I don't care if it's something personally about me, then I might find out about it. And then somebody might be getting a call. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't know, very few people know me 
the 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 character i embellish whatever it is right where we've you know and part of the njf thing and part of the chris jericho uh, stuff you know talking about stuff that i've done it's been 20 odd 20 odd years ago and it was a short period of my life when i was doing certain things but it's just become part of the character that i'm this old whatever i am right this sure. old rogue and, and it it so i but if I find out, and, and I can only think of twice in my life when that's, that I've, I've actually done that. And that was once somebody had mentioned, somebody had said something about me being backstage. And I was like, well, I, that, you don't know anything about me. We've never met. We do. So I got hold of them. I said, look, you say anything you want about my wrestling i couldn't care less because i'm not going to read it don't ever mention my my personal the way i conduct myself personally one you don't know two it's just second hand gossip from from people who shouldn't be gossiping or jealous people or envious people um and and then another thing was because when I got hold of some, well, in through WWE, I got hold of somebody because it was, I, I don't need to go into detail, but a very, very serious, you know, a horrendous incident that people were saying, I, I because I lived in the same area as somebody that, that I knew more than was going on. And I, I had no clue. We've And we've talked about that story on this. Yep. We, we've gone mm -hmm. through all that. That's it. That's my, my part of that world. The only time I ever get any, any, there's one person who, gets hold of me and somehow and that was through somebody else or, or something and and i get the odd message is it okay if i talk to you yeah uh what's it about and it's always unfortunately it's it's to me it's the grim reaper getting hold of me it's about a dead english wrestler right and do it do it did i know him and I, and, it, and if i've got anything good to say i'll say it and otherwise never because I, I, you can put a blowtorch to my face. I am never going to spill any backstage not, don't gossip. I'm never going to. It's just not my world. I don't like. I, I come from a not only the wrestling world, but the people I used to hang around with in clubs and stuff. It's not the thing to be doing. So let's get. We're off that. Subject. Absolutely. But but I get I get other people having to do that because people want praise and people want that. I, we we've talked about this before. I come from a time when it was just sit down shut up do your job and then if you don't get told off you're doing okay and and it's a different world now everybody's from day one if, if, in the last 30 years you know if you if you get into this job you can you're reading about yourself or and if you you don't have that structure that i had which is it again very fortunate for me of great talent from from being very very young from being 17 or well you know even before that but at 17, I had Britain's best wrestler guide him, telling me what, what was right and wrong about my wrestling. From 18, I had Fit Finlay and Rollerball Rocco and Pete Roberts and Terry Rudge and Dave Taylor. And I, I don't need anybody else telling me. Well, well absolutely. And then but we Arn and Rick and Bobby Eaton and well, Paul Arnold right. and, you know, and Ricky Steamboat and... Why do I need anybody else telling me what I need? And to speaking do? of those people, and speaking of listening to people, yeah, you know, we that's why it's going to tie people. into this. Yeah, yeah. The, we listen to people on Twitter, and we put it out on our, um, uh, on our Twitter on uh, for the gentleman villain the podcast. Glass, got glass yeah, jar again. Glass jar. If Brian Danielson uh, hears, yes. there's no plastic being yeah, used please. at no all. Plastic, Brian. Yeah. And uh, we put it out on our Twitter. We put out a poll. We're going to do it every couple of weeks. We're going to put out a poll as to what topics you want to hear about. And the topic we heard about today had to do with some other guys that you respect and put, yes. you know, kind of put you on your wing. And that has to do with you becoming television champion Ooh. in 1993 in WCW. You had a good run as, as, as WCW uh, television champion. Four times. So, and, and unbelievable. Unbelievable at 25 that I, I got that opportunity. I mean, that, well, really unbelievable. Yeah. What was the role that you saw as the television champion? Like, what, what, you know, different chant, like in, in WWE, WWF, it's always been considered, you know, that the Intercontinental title is the working man's title. I always yep. felt that's, that was that's what the, the role of the TV title. T TV title, yes. And if you look at the people who, the majority of people who had it, it was the people who could go out and do, put the time in. 
and with anybody. And that was occasionally it got switched to other people. But if you look at the majority of people, it was the Arn Andersons, the, the, the Tully Blanchards, the Steve Austins, the Bobby Eatons, the, the people that could be relied on uh, proper, proper pros who can do proper pro wrestling. <laughs> We're going to get into, uh, you know, of course, you winning the title for the first time from Mr. Steamboat. But you mentioned Tully Blanchard, who's someone you didn't cross paths with uh, before, no. probably AW. No. Were you watching Crockett before you came to the States? So the first American wrestling that I saw, I'd already nearly been wrestling two years. Because there was, we, we had our own wrestling in Britain, you know, we, 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 you couldn't, and there was no, it's hard now, right? I'm, if I say this, it's not in anybody's brain <laughs> that you can't just watch wrestling all, all the time. I watched wrestling at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, or I went to live shows when I was a child, and that was it. There was no, nothing in like exposing wrestling. You knew what you saw. And you heard whatever you saw you from the commentary, uh, Kent Walton, that was the commentator. So I, kn I knew about wrestlers from other countries. Sometimes they get a mention in, in different things. But uh, it wasn't really. Um, uh, and then I, I started getting, in, in the early 80s, occasionally, occasionally, in the local town, which is now a, considered a city, in, in Britain, you have to have a, a population of over a million to be considered a city. Um, so the the local town to me uh, was seven miles away. Occasionally in a newsstand, as you call it, news agents, as we call it in Britain, I saw, it was like 1981 maybe, a Rings Wrestling Magazine, as what is known as the Apter, Bill Apter, good friend of mine, Bill, Bill's Apter, magazines right um right. oh i couldn't believe it I, i'd like what's this what is this world now I, like i've heard you know obviously no there's wrestling in america that but couldn't didn't know anything about it so with that you used to get all, all about the territories and all the stories and so i had a very that was and I, and i mean when i say very rare every few months there would be one turn up and i used to ask this one lady that worked there any of these that turn up, can you keep one for me? And then there would be uh, the wrestler magazine and stuff. So that was before I was got into the wrestling. That was my sort of introduction to more than just British wrestling, because there was different stories about different people, and 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 it was all fascinating because there was all these incredible photographs and you know George Napolitano and and, and right all the results from all the territories and all the fantastic I loved it I lived in to that. a wrestling fan I mean I, you know me wanting to be a wrestler from being a young oh it was like dream stuff I'd, and I devour these magazines when I could get them which was very rare so eventually I get into the wrestling we've we've gone through all that. Friend of mine, we mentioned him before, Peter Thompson was also in the wrestling. He got the first tapes that I saw, which were would have been in ninety five, uh, sorry, eighty five, nineteen eighty five. So I I had my first match in nineteen eighty three. I didn't start as a full time pro until, which when I say full time pro, I was barely eking a living, but I was still a full-time pro from um, July of 1984. I was, I was 16. So he got some tapes, and the first tapes that he actually got were NWA from Charlotte. So it was like, wow, you know, I, I really, there were certain things that, I, that's very different the way we did stuff because it wasn't the same rule system. You know, the lot we Talked about that, I think, before. British wrestling on, that was on TV and the wrestling that we saw was all in rounds and and there was the Lord Mount Evans rules of, uh, and, of wrestling. And, and the NWA things. at that time was so focused on promos and yes. you said and that, that was there it. wasn't did, a, a, a lot of promos. Anything. Yeah, and, yeah, he didn't see any promos. That must have been an eye-opener for you to see a these guys. like. Tully might come out two or three times a show, right, you know, yeah. just to talk or Rick and, Blair. Uh, that yeah. must have been something for you to see a whole different side of what wrestling could be. A whole different side. And wow, it's just, just you know, that there's, we've talked about this before. There's, there's, 
lot, lot of lot of styles in Britain. People think there's a British style. There's lots of different styles, and things sort of melt melted together a lot more in the eighties. But you know, and every, every weight class there was there was weight classes: uh, lightweight, middleweight, heavy middleweight, light heavyweight, heavy middleweight, um, heavyweight. I think I've got that in the right order. Um, and everyone had a, a British champion, a European champion, and a world champion. For some reason the, the the middleweight champion of the world never showed up in Britain. <laughs> you know, looking back now, but right, you, you, did, right, you just yeah. didn't know. You know, you, yeah. like the lightweight champion at, at, was there was Johnny Saint was the the man in in for twenty years, and and before him there was the, the legendary George Kidd, and there's there was all kinds of fascinating characters in Britain but there was when I, when I watched NWA from you know and then there was sorry there was like these great middleweight wrestlers we've talked about that the what is like the mid heavyweight and, and junior heavyweight but it, we've we've talked about all that before and heavyweight the really good heavyweights were only about very rarely because a lot of them went ab abroad um they, they, you know to, they made more money in germany and japan and, and 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 africa which is what i fortunately got to do from 20 to 24 and then i came to america so i traveled the world so seeing nwa it was a lot bigger fellas but going at it you know like the, there was a heavyweight style which was put on mostly the the good heavyweights in britain were put on if you watch any of the stuff, a lot of it isn't, um, it, it's very credible looking, solid looking wrestling, which is a lot of what I did. Um, even though I was a character when I came to America, once I started doing so, is, is forearm and forearm smashing and putting holes on and, and, and people before me had done that in America, obviously legendary Billy Robinson and, and Tony Charles and, and Les Thornton and, and and people and Adrian Street did did a lot of that style, but was more flamboyant. But they, it was put on specifically to give wrestling in Britain that style was not so much a, a lot of villainy and 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 baby faces. It was more of two heavyweights to go on so that they could say people couldn't couldn't knock the style if that makes any sense. The promoters sure. wanted the heavyweights to do a certain style and, and more just credible, competitive, credible style to give the right. job credibility. Right. So to see the NWA and watching these big fellas moving about and watching Manny Fernandez, the first one, I think <laughs> one of the first things I saw was him doing like jumping on the ropes from the, in the middle rope and doing a, a climb. Back. And I'm like, Whoa, this is yeah. different. In fact, Little story to add to this. We saw that. We went to a show that that day or the next day, and my friend Peter who got the tape. The rings in. We used to have to. We used to do all these loads of little shows in Britain. In, in, did he on, try on a flying coast. forearm off the ropes? What he what <laughs> we did? He put the we put the ring up because, and there was no people in this this building. We put the ring up, and it was a fourteen foot ring, and it and the the promoter we work for, Bobby Barron, I. I, I absolutely he was like a second dad to me i wouldn't be in this job without him nor would robbie brookside and a lot of people in britain it was one of the few guys that would give people a chance and and it, i've talked about him before so i don't need to talk about him but he was known for having really bad rings right in fact his nickname was dodgy dodgy in england means something that's suspect a bit not not right and they used to call him dodgy bob and it wasn't because he was a dodgy promoter he was always a he's always looked after everybody as far as money it was because his rings were dodgy they were all suspect in fact I t this is i'm going off on these tales so again unfortunately in 1994 he passed away and it it was I, I got the news i was in america and i got the news i flew back for his funeral and i'm there with, there's loads of wrestlers there dave taylor i had i hadn't seen for a year or so, because he, you know, he hadn't moved to America yet. Dave was there with Dave's brother Steve, with Dave's dad Eric Taylor, who was an incredible wrestler in in his in the fifties and sixties and the early seventies. Um, we were the loads of wrestlers there, 
and there's all the flowers outside the ring, Bobby, you know. And Bobby Barron's best friend was a, a fellow called Jack, and he'd had this ring made out of flowers, and it was like a, a wrestling ring, and it had beautiful, he used to wrestle as beautiful Bobby Barron, beautiful Bobby Barron, all in lovely flowers. And we, and we just all stood there looking at the flowers, and I'm stood next to Dave Taylor, and and Steve, T Steve is Dave's brother, and Steve just went, that's the best ring he's ever had. <laughs> and we just started, <laughs> we just started laughing. So back to this, we watched this NWA, and I see Manny Fernandez, we, we're watching all kinds of stuff, but Manny Fernandez jumping on the middle rope in the middle of the ring. We put the ring up the next day. There's nobody there. Peter just goes, runs, jumps onto the middle, onto the middle rope. And obviously the rope, the ropes were crap, you know, right. he just broke straight and off and he went straight <laughs> through and landed on the floor and like creamed himself. He was all got, oh, <laughs> lying on the floor. So we figured out you couldn't really do the stuff. They had these really good rings and we didn't, you know, that was, that. so that was how it sort of started me watching Tully, uh, you know, on the, the four horsemen, dusty, everybody. And right. then, so that was my introduction to, to, to whoever was the, the TV champion at the time. And, and we were getting those pretty regularly after that. And Pete, well, Peter was. And so he'd lend them me and I'd watch them whenever we had time because it didn't have a lot of time because we were working all the time. Right. So it was watching, that was sort of our, our start of watching American wrestling and, was the NWA. And the reason I bring that up is because you know, we talked about you, we, we mentioned briefly that in that NWA era, you didn't really see competitive matches except that TV title, that TV, TV title, title, you would see some, you would see a Manny Fernandez face a Tully Blanchard. You would yes. see a Buddy Landell face, you know, um, you know, a Dusty Rhodes who had the TV title for a bit, but fast forward to when you get to WCW in 93, it doesn't take you long. You know, you get there, uh, you know, in early 93, I think. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 I came late 92. On, uh, I started on my, my first day was the 25th of January, uh, 1993, which is going to be nearly 30 years soon. Isn't <laughs> My it? goodness. It and, and it fast forward a few months to the fall to the first fall brawl yeah. ever. Yes. And you find yourself competing for the, uh, uh, for the TV title. Oh. And there's a lot going on in WCW there's a at lot the time, you know, there's a lot you've got going Bill on. Watts coming in and out. You've got, yeah, you've well, got, Bill uh, Watts brought me here and then he, he goes after three months. So I'm thinking, well, I'm gone. This is before I became Lord Stephen. I think he, I, I, I'm going. So anyway, it all worked out. I became Lord Stephen and for whatever reason, Somebody like me, and I know Oli had a lot to do with that, and I know Greg Gagne and Mike Graham and um, Dusty, and they, what for whatever reason, they were people that were in the office at the time. They took a liking to me, Barry you... Windham. So I, I, I'm, I'm stood across the ring in Houston. With Michael Buffer, who was as over as could possibly be at the time, it's, and as I, soon and as I'm, I saw, yeah, unbelievable, right? I'm, I and I'm and Ricky Steamboat, a man, and I think we've talked about this. I used to watch Ricky Steamboat's matches with Ric Flair. Those that series from from 1989, where I would do squats to those that series of matches. I would do them and do my Hindu squats to him, thinking if I can keep up with him, I can keep up with anybody because the, the pace they <laughs> were going. Amazing. And I would do sometimes, you know, over a thousand squats or whatever it was. If that one hour match, I know I, I would base it, like do, do squats for the whole match. Then they had like the 30 minutes. So whatever amount of matches, there was, was a three or four of them in that particular series. I got those on tape. And for whenever, whenever I was in England, I would put them on. That was my sort of, okay. This, this keeps me in rhythm and sometimes I'd speed it up. So I'd do them faster on the fast, on the shorter matches on the hour match. I would take my time a bit. It was like a, so I, I'm really know a lot about those matches. I've watched them so many times and that was over the next couple of years. Um, whenever I was back in England, that was my thing. When, if I was at home, I'd get up in the morning and I would put that tape on and I would do my squats to it. To, to watching their matches 
right? It, 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 that, that was before I went to the gym, before I did anything else, I'd do my, but what I, my conditioning training was, was, was Hindu squats. And so this is Ricky Steenbock now. I'm stood and, and this all happened so quick, you know, I'm, I'm in Germany wrestling in, you know, sometimes in 10 big tents for week. We say, I'm, I'm in the best place you can be in, 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 in Europe, but I've come to America. It's all like pow. I, I, and I'm 24. Then I turned 25 in the May of 93. And in September, I'm stood in opposite Ricky Steamboat with Michael Buffer announcing from Blackpool, England. And I'm thinking, I, I, I may look cool, calm, cool and collected. I am going, what am I doing here? How has this happened in such a short? Because, you know, like it's just like, it's really like somebody punching me in the face got, and, and, and got, luckily I, I, I know how to ke keep my composure. I wanted to just go, oh, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, well, well, you know, and not, not through, no, not through not thinking I could do it, but like as a, even as a fan going, what am I doing in this ring with Ricky Steamboat and, and Michael, well, Michael Buffer was just an extra thing, but. Ricky Steamboat stood there and I'm about to face him for the, for the WCW World Television Championship. And knowing since 85 that this was the, 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 the championship that you had to be able to go, right? And I'm, I'm going to add right. this in now. We've talked about the squat. Like, my hair's still a bit wet. I've just done my squats this, b before we did this and jumped in the shower before we did this. Because... I still, it, it, it was, it was a, like the machines, I always call it like you had to be a machine to, to have any, any like legs as a, as a television champion, because every match, every show that WCW did, you were doing a, 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 a match on it. Well, we used to tape like two, either two or sometimes three tapings a, 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 in a night. And you might, and I was used to doing long matches, but a ten-minute draw, three in three, and I've done plenty, plenty of those in that next. Because if you look, I was it was about an eighteen-month period. Every single TV show, I, that's you know, and at that time, that's why I sort of made my name because I was on TV. They gave me that opportunity. I was on TV on every single show, doing a draw. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Doing a draw I've with noticed, somebody, yeah. either 10 or 15 minute draw. Right. And I think that, you know, that I'm not, that's not kid ourselves. They used to shave the times to suit the TV, whatever, make it sometimes it wasn't quite right. 15 minutes. It might have been 30. Turner time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, but still doing. And for every Arn Anderson, Terry Taylor, Brad Armstrong, Ricky Steamboat, any of the, the brilliant wrestlers that are wrestled, and then. And, and and if it was people who weren't on contract, I had, had such an incredible amount of I incredible extra talent with Frankie Lancaster, Mark Starr, um, Barry Houston, people like that, people that were really good that a lot of them had trained with uh, Dean Malenko's dad, you know, so they were all really good. I had really good people, but for every one of those that I had, I had a lot of people that weren't. <laughs> And to get through 10 minute draws or yeah. 15 minute draws with some, some people when we start and, and at the same time as well, in that September, I think it was, a, was it September or October? Whoever, if you look this up was when we did the first ever Orlando tapings that be, there were like the worldwide shows, which is because every company since then has done that. But it was the first time we did four days and did 13 shows in four days. Wow. I had to do 14 or 13 or 14 10 minute draws in four days, which great Arn Anderson, great Terry Taylor, great Brad Armstrong, but <laughs> buh, 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 me and at the, at the, like the end of, and I was, and I was a conditioning machine. Believe me, I, I could, I was doing all that. I always might not add be cosmetically in, in what considered great shape. Then again, though, I used to, people used to say I, I didn't have a sort of a great physique. When I go back now and look compared with some wrestlers now. It's not funny. It, it's like I, I used to, yeah, I was in, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of things we're going to get into now, but 
I used to be constantly training. You know, I was always training and, 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 and the machine step up squats were because I knew I had to go. Right. Um, there's a lot of my physique had changed from, I think we've talked about that in, when, in 20, in, uh, and when we're I was talking 22. about someone who's six foot three, I'm six foot three and two and 240 and, pounds, two, uh, maybe, five, 240. Two, maybe, maybe that, or maybe a bit more. That's a and, different kind of being in shape. You know, yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, different level than, yeah. than if you're a bit smaller than that. Like and you, when I, like I used to, there's pictures knocking about on me when I had more of a bodybuilder kind of look. Well, when I was 22, I kept that for a while. But once I came to America, once I, especially once I changed to Lord Stephen, I realized this and this and the work rate. The face, yeah. It was more, and this match is the match. I don't never complain, but this, this match against Ricky Steamboat was the night that I broke my neck and never told anybody for 20 years. Wow. I just watched yeah, and the match. You can see, you can see the match. If you yeah, look, I just watched right, the match. Watch, watch the very end, and you will see Ricky Steamboat skin the cat. And right. I grab him in a German suplex, and yeah. I can always soup. I go back, and if you watch, my neck just goes bang. Just, oh, my and both goodness. of my arms and both of my legs went lightning bolts down, and and I thought something's not right here. But I get my hand held up at the end of it and, with a belt in the other hand. And I don't ever tell anybody. Right. And that can continued until I was 45. And, and so there was times when my body was shot, but I always kept doing my squats and I always kept doing. So there was times when I, I might look a bit better, but there was a while after that, that I couldn't barely lift my arms up, but I was still wrestling constant. I never stopped. And I You're just never told anybody until when was it March this year, when I decided to, finally tell people right but that's the truth i, I and, broke my neck on that match with the my, the first night that I, I i i uh wrestled ricky steamboat there's so much to unpack there because you know you're a young guy you get this chance you get the yeah. title your neck breaks you don't tell anybody it, no you're not really as you drink out of your non-plastic cup um you you know you don't you're not a regret guy you're 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 not no. a guy who goes not the slides, but no. you are a guy who works with younger people if you were working with a young person today in that same situation, you you would say, "What? No, no! Give up the title, get the surgery, take the rehab." Do That's, whatever. I guess the lesson you learned was you learned. Well, I didn't for other know people. I broke my neck. Right. I just thought I'd hurt my neck really badly. And 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 <laughs> really knowing, badly. It you really know, hurt. like I've explained that on 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 Chris Jericho spoke. Of it. What happened, for whatever reason, some something exploded and a big lump of like jellyfied calcium stuff kept my neck together for 20 years. So after a while, it, it went okay. Oh, the pain, there was like no pain. It, it, it like sort of cut right. off all the nerves and stuff. So it, it was, although I broke my neck, it, 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 it got, the only problems I used to get, like my arms was never, my arm was never right again in, on the left side. Right. And I used to get a, like a really a lot of spasm, spasming on my left side, which still isn't good on my left side. Yeah, that's what trap. I get for my neck surgery is the left right. arm. The, le yeah. the left trap, yeah. yeah. So, but I never thought, I, it was just another day in the wrestling and get on with it. When, but, when they told you, uh, hey, do you have any recollection of them telling you, hey, you're wrestling for the title, you're getting the title. I know you said titles aren't a big deal for you, but for you, also as a young, respectful young man watching wrestling this fella, Ricky Steamboat, who oh. used to do Hindu squats watching, not to mention this guy was in WrestleMania 1. This oh. guy's been around for a long time. And, it and must an have meant the world that this title was bequeathed to you by him. Uh, this show is sponsored by Better Help Therapy online you know we all wish life came with a user manual especially in these times we're still seeing a lot of the after effects from the quarantine and all the things that went into that not to mention life wasn't exactly a bowl of roses before the quarantine and the transition into into getting into therapy can be difficult but better help online therapy is basically the next best thing to getting a user manual for this crazy thing that we all life you know and in life it's normal to feel stuck when you feel stuck therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills which makes therapy kind of the closest thing to a guided tour of this complex engine called you 
BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of therapy. They're doing a lot of good work because it's convenient, secure, and accessible anywhere and is 100% online. For myself, therapy has been a great thing. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again because I live inside my own head. I don't talk to people. I don't listen to people. I don't like people, except Mr. Regal. But if I need to bounce some ideas off somebody, I really don't have a lot of people I can do it. But with therapy, it helps you kind of get rid of these crazy notions. If you have like negative self-talk or that kind of thing, just saying them out loud to somebody who tells you, hey, maybe, maybe there's a different way to look at it. Um, therapy can be a very, very beneficial thing. And it's never been easier than with BetterHelp. Everyone deserves to feel their best. BetterHelp makes it easier to get started. As the world's largest therapy service, they've matched millions of people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. All the benefits of in-person therapy, plus you don't have to park, you know, you don't have to drive, you don't have to talk to some secretary, is more convenient, more accessible, and more affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. And by the way, if you do try therapy, you know, in any type, you know, if it doesn't work out the first time, you, you know, it's hard to get, it can be difficult to link up two people. And what BetterHelp does is they make it very easy to switch if you feel the need. It really can't be simpler than doing it with BetterHelp. There's no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Because, like, it's hard. How do you choose out of a phone book? It's, it's, it's hard. I've done it. You know, uh, it, with, with BetterHelp, it's a much easier process. It's literally the, the, the best possible evolution of, of getting therapy and having therapy. And getting unstuck, which you can do with BetterHelp. Learn more about BetterHelp and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash gentleman. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash gentleman. And we thank them for sponsoring the Gentleman Villain Podcast. Absolutely. Uh, uh, unbelievable and couldn't believe it. And, and and on top of that, you know, I think it's... It, universally known ricky is an absolute gentleman of, of the highest order nicest and, guy and, and, nicest and, guy and possible yeah. so and 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 from the day i got here he was one of the people that would always come and say oh i like the way you did that because i was on tv you see what you see we were with bill watts when i first got here had us on a lot of our shows a lot of live events. Well, Ricky was always on them, on the team that I was on. Um, it was him and Shane Douglas against uh, the Hollywood Blondes, um, Steve Austin and Brian Pillman. So I was always on those shows and he would come and, and say, um, you might want to change this a little. You know, just things that, and always positive stuff and always helped me because I was, I suppose, because I was quiet and polite and, and he could see that I was... A, the, uh, a real pro wrestler and Let's eager to way. learn you were eager, eager to, learn. to learn you listened but he liked what i did as well right. you know like he like he liked the stuff that so and i know sometimes it's weird bringing his name up but a lot of people forget that me and chris benoit came here at the same time right we both started in january of, of 93 well, they didn't know what to do with us, either of us, really, because at first, before I became Lord Stephen. Y'all both were very different. Like you said right. you said earlier, oh, we had Billy Robinson and Les Thornton. I'd been watching wrestling for, what, 12 years by the time I saw you. Yeah. All I knew of Les Thornton was he was the guy who worked underneath matches, uh, you know, on TV against the Bulldogs, people like that. Never saw Billy Robinson. So you were the first of a kind I ever saw. And also Benoit was the first of a kind I ever saw. Kind yeah. of a high flyer. Got a hi kind a of a but a hybrid style. Yeah, hybrid style, Canada, right. That Canada, uh, uh, Calgary territory was such a hybrid thing. And then the Japanese, and you, he'd been to Europe. So there was times when we were put on to, together. And I can, this is probably the, I, I'm never one for talking about me getting compliments, but this is the greatest compliment I ever had. And it's the only time I've ever heard Ricky Steamboat swear. Oh my, okay. In, in all the times. He'd watched a match of, he'd stood at the curtain and watched a match of me and Chris. This would have been early, maybe February or March of 90, 
uh, uh, of 93, and he walked back in and he went, you two are some working some bitches. <laughs> and you heard, that's coming from Ricky. A fella who does, I mean, and, and some bitches isn't exactly a swear word, but he doesn't say stuff like that. And then, then he was asking us about how we did, because we did a lot of that wrist lock stuff, which is people do all the time now, but people weren't doing that stuff then. It was right. it wasn't, you know, putting a wrist lock on and the escapes from a wrist lock and doing stuff that became more prevalent in 2000. I was doing, I did it a lot in the early 90s and then I saw, I, I still did it, but there was maybe, it didn't get noticed as much. One of the things of being the TV champion and being on TV all the time, I, this happened at the end of 94. So I was on TV all the time and then I'm going around all the buildings all the time and I'm doing all my stuff that I could, you know, a lot of it was me. I'm the, the exact opposite of every other supposed technical wrestler in the world. I made my credibility it was me putting myself in, having people put me in moves and me trying to escape from them and do the occasional escape. Then because it was a bit different than anybody else, I got no, became known as a technical wrestler. But if you actually gone back and watch, especially in this period, you're a bit of a brawler. Uh, well, that was after, right? At first, there was a little bit of brawling, but really it was me just having people put me in a wrist lock or me start with a wrist lock having, and then me escaping from looking like I'm trying to escape and getting flustered trying to escape from it. Right, right. Which was doing me doing like kip ups and all kinds of reversals, but then ending up back in a wrist lock again. Right. Which was most other technical wrestlers do loads of moves to people and do technical. I was doing it in a different way. Because that was a skill set I'd learned before I came to America from the Pete Robertses and Dave Taylors and Marty Joneses and people that, because that's what you had to do when you went out the country was make other wrestlers who can't wrestle look, look like good. they can wrestle. Right. So, but I did so much of it. This is like a comedian telling, going on TV every week Tell the and same telling joke. your best joke. Yeah. At the end of 94, because I'd been on so many TV matches doing and, and again, when I was on with Arn Anderson, we just reacted to each other. Uh, Terry Taylor, same. Brad Armstrong, the same. Ricky Steamboat, the same. Brian Pillman, the same. We, we just, it, it, whoever it was, it didn't matter. We didn't think about anything. But when I was on with people who couldn't do a lot, a lot of bodybuilders that couldn't do, that was my go-to sort of me escaping from things and putting myself in and out of holes, right? This is about right. the most you'll ever get me exposing my tricks. But at the end of 94, I came out um, at the back of Charlotte. Charlotte at the time was a place where they'd obviously, and it ties into this NWA thing, they'd seen so much incredible wrestling, the fans there. And I was, I would always sign autographs as a, as a villain. I never, because I, I knew I was confident in myself. As soon as I walked out, the same people I could be signing an autograph and being polite to, I would never be over polite. I would just sort of, thank you. And, and whether some villains wouldn't do that. I, I was confident that I could get them back like that, which I it, could. Isn't that so, though, isn't that more realistic though, really? Is, is a guy who is just a, a, a heel, a villain in the ring, but outside the ring, you're a bit of a professional as opposed to a guy who's just being a crazy, terrible good. person outside of but the ring all the time. I also did it with, uh, you know, I was always dressed in a certain way. Right, I did it right. with a, like a, yes, you know, it, it's kind but of it, a thing. It but, seems more realistic than if you were just walking around with your hand behind your back, yes. ignoring people, you know? So I came out the back of Charlotte um, and there was a, a fan, some fans there, and they asked me for an autograph. And one of them said to me, this isn't the end of 94, they said, we like you. And, I, and, I, and basically that's what they said. And I went, do you mind me asking why? And they said, well, we figured it out. And this was a, a really a lot before overexposure of, of, of the wrestling. No internet, trade. no nothing. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you know, if you read, you could. A couple heard, books, a couple but there weren't that many books out then either. It wasn't that much. So yeah. this is, you know, again, from a, anybody that's young listening to this, they don't understand what that was like at that time. This was all different. You know, there was peeps, certain small group of fans that, that could read 
certain things, but it wasn't what it was by the time the 2000s came along. So they said, oh, we like you. And I said, do you mind me asking you why? And I think we've explained this before. I've always asked questions because I've learned things. And this was the first real, and this was a punch in the face, to, like as far as learning something. They went, well, we figured it out. When these fellas, uh, you make everybody look like they can do stuff. And that's, you know, they, they appreciated that the, they'd seen so much good wrestling. They understood it. the way, However it was phrased to me, they said, we we figured out these fellas can't do anything but clotheslines, but when they wrestle you, they can do all these moves that we never see anybody else do. And it was a big in the face to me. I thought, that's it. I've got to change my style because I've uh, overexposed it on TV. Right. So I kept that. Then my stuff changed a lot to a lot more striking and a lot more face pulling and a lot more commit. It wasn't, there was always that in, 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 certain parts of what I did, but I completely tried to leave the, 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 the intricate wrestling to people who actually knew how to react to it without giving it away. If that you makes stopped, any sense. Right. You stopped doing it in a way where uh, it was too just, obvious, right? Giving it to people. And, and, and why would I know any better? Then I'm 26, uh, 27. Right. Right. I, I, like, so I'm still trying to figure this out. You know, it, just because I looked whatever I looked and I what but I'm I've, I've been wrestling what 11 years then and ev right. everywhere I went I had to learn something new so this is America I had to learn a completely new way of doing things and yeah my stuff fit in and I could fit in with all a lot of the, the people that had come from the 80s and, and that but there was a group of 90s wrestlers that were wrestling school wrestlers and that was no it's no knock on anybody it was just a different period they hadn't come through territories where they had to adapt and stay around. They'd been gone to wrestling school and then got hired by companies. And then you either, they either figured it out or they didn't. Right. And right. then it sort of, that was how it was. There wasn't, you couldn't go to, you know, like if you started in the eighties and like Steve Austin and Brian Pillman were the last of those kind of people that, the and you know, there's a few others, but they're the ones that I knew that were, you had to go all these different places and, and either figure it out or you didn't have a job. And a lot of it was, and, and I was at the beginning of that in, in 93, I got to WCW and was like, I won't, don't need to mention names, but oh, well, he's an hairdresser and he's, he's a bodybuilder and they've just gone, right, you can be a wrestler. <laughs> right. Right? right and then everybody and if you go back and look who are the people that are having to wrestle them Arn anderson terry Z taylor Zabisco, Fred, Zabisco. Yeah. everybody yeah. everybody that and that tv title is a is a it actually if you want to look at it from a very if you ever want you know i know people look at this in all different ways go back and look at that and look at the people who held it and look at the the transition into the 90s when you started seeing more wrestling school wrestlers and seeing the people the arms and the people like that who had to carry these people that is a, a we could that's a different topic altogether but that there was a lot of having to teach people on the like okay put them in and out of positions because and and there was the arms Terry Taylor, Bobby Eaton, Steve Austin, because he picked it up incredibly quickly in his first few years in the te whatever territories he worked in. Brian Pillman had be been in Calgary, and anybody who'd been in Calgary had, had, right. had to, if, else you just wouldn't have had a job there. You wouldn't have lasted there. Right. You had to pick right. it up. You, they were actually far better than ever, ever I was at their stage of the game because it took me a long time to get to it. Would, you know, it wasn't until I was 20, but. I, took me four solid years and having the best trainers working full time, they picked it up in, in a year and a half or whatever it was. You know, they picked it up a lot quicker than I ever did. And Chris Benoit did as well. And two bolts, two called Scorpio. And they picked this job up a lot quicker than I ever did. And, and were very good by the time I met them in, in 93. So, well, you had, um, all those people to wrestle with in 93, yeah. you wrestled Ricky steamboat. You beat him for the title. Uh, and broke your neck at football. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
you kept wrestling. You didn't stop. You had some house shows. You wrestled Mark Starr, uh, who you mentioned earlier. Mark one was of the, a, what a fantastic one of the unsung. Uh, yeah, right. Fantastic. I, I, I'm, I'm glad I mentioned. I got to mention those. Mark, Frankie Lancaster, Barry Houston, um, I, and I apologize to any of the fellas that I did. But you'll see that I wrestled. If you look at the the actual TV matches, I got to wrestle a lot of these fellas all the time, and then and, and continued it when when I was in tags with. With Triple H and then tags with Bobby, I still the same group of fellas that that because they're not they were not known for being really good at the job and really good extras. They're uns, un, unsung heroes of of the entire earlier years of my time in WCW. They all uh, uh, any of them that I, I I can't remember now. You know that the, the, the but those three that people that I became you know close with them friends and I, in fact I. I talked to Barry the other day on the phone. It, it's we've stayed friends, but they they were fantastic. So they they could they could go on with anybody, but if they you put them on with somebody good, they had really good matches. You know, I think one of the and then the oh I'm forgetting. How can I forget? Because they're so close close to me. But I hope, I've mentioned Brad, but then Steve and Scott, yeah, and Brian. And Brian. Yeah. I wrestled Brian. He was oh, there. Road dog. Yeah, he yeah, was there he before was there. he went to WWE. So I had the Armstrong boys to wrestle all the time. And and it, it was that was all incredible. So I saw yeah. footage recently of a picture taken on the beach, uh WCW at the time, where oh, Brian know. Armstrong, Brian James, the road dog, is holding a boom. He's holding a mic boom in the picture. You know, so those guys are just doing everything behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh not not just wrestling, you know. Yeah, I mean um, I, I wrestled Brian when he first I know he'd been wrestling a bit, but he he just come out the the forces and 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 he, you know I had the, and at least one or two uh, matches when I was a, I think I think I was the TV champion then, um, and and then I wrestled Brad quite a lot and a lot on a lot of live events. I wrestled Scott and Steve all the time, and they were fantastic. So it, I had I had that that first couple of. Years, the only thing that messed anything up in WCW for me was me, and that was from '97 through, you know. That's a that's a lot of us in our twenties, though. It's not just you, no, like a lot you know, of us, like you know, I, I, for sure. And, and we've talked about that before. For sure. I had an incre I had an incredible time in WCW. They were always good to me. I had a, a, whether it be and even the people that weren't good that I had to wrestle, it learned me something because I learned you learn another skill set of how to. I knew, I already knew I, I knew a skill set going to different countries that I, before I came to America. But then you add to that skill set, and then you add to it so it works on American in American system and, and American TV, and that and and the the amount of promo time I had as the TV champion, you, you, that that's what really cemented my sort of standing in the job with everybody that was around at the time. You know, it might not have been the, I wasn't a high And that's high something you very much, you learned that from watching American television more than your experience uh, before, uh, or being part of American television before you came uh, to the U.S. You didn't do a lot of promos, right? You talked about no, how no. they, so this is no. a, a new skill set that and that was learning. Like, that was all down to Mr. Shivani. And you're giving me that, that Yeah, yeah we, we, we've talked about that before, but yeah, giving me, giving me the opportunity to go down to the CNN center on a, on a Wednesday on a days off and putting a camera there for me, which was one of them great, huge big cameras in those days in a little spare room on the side, uh, where they, cause they were doing all their market specific promos in, in another room. And I was just in there on my own, just doing promo after promo after promo that this was when I first got here in the January of 93 and I kept doing it. And then, that eventually tied into me doing um as, when I was still just Steve Regal uh doing promos for for on on the Saturday night shows or some shows little ones and then once I I, I think it was June when I became Lord Stephen and then promo after promo I, I did nothing but in, I, I what I, it blows my mind when I go back and look how much incredible TV time and promo opportunity time that people would would literally die for now. I had nothing but that because I, I, I constantly. 
Yeah, T- to WCW give me all that incredible time, TV time. Yeah, that TV time is gold, and it was gold for you. You know, you, you did the Mark Starr match. You did some, uh, that match is listed in your match listings, but I know you did a lot more. Uh, the, the, but the, Yeah, those match listings are only going to be so yeah. many, right? Because there's so many live events. Sure. You're not going to have all these little, I doubt very much if there's all those little spot shows, um, and spot stuff. shows yeah. That, yeah. that were, you know, in all over Florida and like Steve Austin can tell you that they say, you know, me and him travel together. So we're doing 10 days on in, in like high school gyms all over the South southeast part of america constantly so w- there were just non-stop shows i can't see there being that many of those uh being recorded but you know you talked about the wrist lock stuff you talked about yeah. and and someone we haven't talked about a lot really at all yet and someone that i'm sure you have a lot to say on is your first pay-per-view defense at halloween havoc against Davy Boy Smith, the British yep. Bulldog himself. And, yeah. you know, those clips make the rounds sometimes on Twitter, just little clips of you, mostly the wrist stuff, mostly, you know, a lot of the yes. wrist lock stuff. Uh, that must have been a thrill for you to wrestle a fellow countryman, uh, you know, Calgary, but at the same time, he's he's um, from where you're from in a lot of ways. What was well, your was, relationship? I was in awe of him because of, of how he'd made it, you know. Like, it, it, when I first started it, Dynamite Kid and David Boy Smith had made it. If if you're same as me, if you're a working class English kid and you make it, you get in. Not only get into the wrestling and 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 don't forget, I was watching them as as a child. I, as you know, I'm, I I think Dynamite was ten years older than me. I'm not sure how many David Boy maybe eight. And I don't think people was, understand how man how revolutionary, how exciting, how explosive. The British Bulldogs were when they broke oh, on, so, especially American television. But I, I was getting to watch them when they was, I think Davey was 15 the first time he was on TV. And then I got to see him in my local wrestling hall live. And same with Dynamite. Dynamite was 16, I believe. And I, I, I think I was nine or 10 when he was first on. And it blew my mind. I was like, I want, I, I never got anywhere close to being the, have the ability that they had. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just... Cause, and that's actually you talked about the match with me and Davy Boy. It's the, that's the reverse of that of, of what what I talked about before. That's just me holding his wrist and him doing all this incredible stuff. <laughs> I, I couldn't do any of that. I couldn't do any of those head springs and all that yeah. stuff. But it's just me and him doing a, a, a British, more more British style that was that that became more prevalent in the 2000s with the ring of honor crew and 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 all the young because of the tape trade as we've talked about that before getting some a lot like the johnny saint matches and different stuff and steve there's a steve gray and Cl- uh, clive myers iron fist clive myers match was doing the rounds and a lot of the fellas and then fortunately brian danielson coming into my life in 2000 and him taking more of an interest in that european stuff and 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 it all sort of spread and you know, like then there was the mixture with all the 2000 lads uh, and ladies that that were trying to make a, a world for themselves because they didn't think they could get to w, WWE, you know, because they weren't, you know, six foot odd and whatever else. So they, if you, then you'll notice there's a lot more of the wrist stuff and that, but there was nobody doing that apart from, there, there would have been me, Davey Boy, Chris Benoit and, and uh, Scorv. Scorpio would have been doing that in 93. And then it went, we we sort of, they, we all went our own ways. And then at the end of 95, Dean, Eddie, Chris came back in the November to WCW. And then it became quite, quite normal to see that kind of stuff again. But there was a while where, you know, because they, at the beginning, Scorp and, and Davey Boy, both all, Davy Boy, Chris, and Scorpio weren't around much longer in '93. They right. went their own, went the different ways. So there was only me doing it for the next what a few years. That was me that was doing that style and keeping all that kind of stuff going with the people I could do it with, or however I, I, I figured it out. And then with with you know Dean, if you ever watch Dean, is very. Oh, yeah. Very much European style stuff mm-hmm. because of, of 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 the Carl Gotch influence and, and you know he, he didn't 
I, I, I don't know why, why he didn't spend... I know he came to, to Germany and did matches. I don't know why he didn't spend a lot more time in Europe because when you watch him, it's like watching a European wrestler. But then he, he like, it, all eyes were on and, and once you've got those guys doing that stuff and it, everybody by that, there was, there was that group of fellas um, that things started molding together. Uh, and, and then with ECW being around and now that then fellas like Eddie and, and, and Eddie wrestled at like a, a lot more European style. He didn't, he didn't do the, the wrist lock stuff the same. He, 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 he did do some of that, but if you watch him, you know, he was doing that. There was that, is that like hybrid? He was, he was doing his Lucha style and whatever, but he, he never worked that much in America, but he, he, he's uppercuts and different things that are very, he, uh, picked up in, I don't know where, but that, there was a, a connection between Calgary, Japan and, and Europe. And it, and right. somehow there was, there's, there was a group of like young wrestlers that all sort of, and I was more traditional British style cause I couldn't do the, the stuff that they could do the flying stuff. But that group of us were, were all sort of. A lot of it probably came creative. from, you know, a Sayama and Dynamite Kid getting together many years before. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, that's where all those cultures really yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of slammed together, you know, maybe the first time. With with you and Davy Boy, of course, we we would like to imagine, you know, that, that you know, this is a guy that you probably looked up to, that you saw wrestling oh, when you were younger. Yeah. What was it like for you when he came in, and what was your relationship well, like? Well, we came in together, and, uh, like, it, that, I know, so I get the call to come to America, right? And then... Right as I'm coming in, I hear about um, the fact that Davy Boy's coming to WCW as well. So I come in and we got on like house on fire straight away. But he's, you know, he's a big deal there. I'm just me when I get there and eventually do the the, the Lord thing. And then, you know, and, and I think I'm staying around for a bit anyway. Because I didn't think I, once I came here, I'd, my stuff wasn't working on TV. It was on live events because I had time. And I was wrestling Chris a lot, so. Right. Um, but uh, Davey was already a big star. Davey was a big a huge star. star. So that was a big acquisition big, because big he'd come off his singles star, run yeah. in WWE at yes, the time. Yes, huge, yeah. huge. And, and just the year before, it sold out Wembley. Wembley, yeah, yeah. Right. As, as the headliner, right? I mean, we, yeah. not, you know, not Wembley Arena, Wembley Stadium. <laughs> right. It's just like, you know, so. Davey, you couldn't you couldn't move in Britain without hearing about the, the British bulldog. It, you know, unfortunately, it was the British bu it, bulldogs. Uh, but um, unfortunately, dyna you know, dynamite had got hurt. But in in ninety two, see, I was away for most of the year. We've talked about that before. I was away for nine months of nineteen ninety two. I flew back. There was a one week break. Um, from at the end of. August, I was in Vienna for seven weeks for, which again, incredible. I was in the middle, in the most beautiful city in Europe for seven weeks in the same building every day uh, it, 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 in an outside tent. That's the best area. part about doing a podcast yeah. with you is once in a while, you'll talk about something and you'll just stop and you'll be like, my God, that was awesome. We <laughs> that used to was do, so great. I mean, those, we've talked about the German tournaments, but it was the, the seven weeks of the summer was in Vienna right in the city center of Vienna in a ten outside tennis stadium. And next door was this thousand year old building where the Vienna boys choir practiced. Wow. We'd get there at six o'clock at night and they'd, you could hear them singing coming out of there. And then we'd, we'd wrestle there. That, well, we finished there and Rip Rogers was with, with, with us that year, uh, 92. We went, we, we had a week off. So we went back to England. It just turned up the other day. There was a bill on 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 something showed up the other day because I look at those those old English bills and there was a, a and I I did I think we did three shows that week in England. We stayed in my house in Blackpool, but we had there was a week off in between finishing Vienna and starting Hanover for nine weeks. Hanover in Germany with nine weeks in the same place, but we had a week off, so we went back to England and we did three shows. So Rip got to wrestle in in Britain, but. Um, and then we went back. Well, the week, the day that we landed in, in England, we landed in London. 
all I could hear, oh, sorry, the, the, the same day, uh, I, I, I get, we get there and I, I'm seeing all these, these, uh, I, have I got this right or wrong here? I think I've got this right. Yeah, I, I think I've got this right. I, there was a week, anyway, there, if it's not this week, there was another short period of time when I flew in, whenever that show was. So it might not, no, it might have been, I had to go home anyway for something. I was in England and I flew in and the WWE fellas were, were at the, uh, at the, at the same airport. I didn't see Davey, but I saw a few fellas and I didn't want to go up to him and say, you know, I'm, I'm a wrestler or anything. <laughs> right, but I right. flew in that day because they were all getting there ready for SummerSlam whenever that was. So I don't know how, how that worked. I think it was that week with me and Rip. Wow. That's something else. Huh? That's crazy. And yeah. so Davey boy had sold out Wembley. So I got, I, I go back to finish off my year in Germany, which was the nine weeks in, in Hanover, a week off. No, that was the week I went on for it. That was it. I went home at the end of August. That was when SummerSlam was rip. Didn't come then I went on for a week. I went back and did nine weeks in, in Hano Hanover. Then I came back for a week before we started five weeks in Bremen. That is the week that rip came with me. Um, so yeah, I came home after Vienna for a week so so i could see my family i didn't wrestle that week i just i went home to see my family um and the day i landed was when when the wwe people were coming in and and i saw them and they saw Wembley. so when davy boy was arriving in wcw i'm like wow great i mean and, and we got on like an house on fire because we knew all the same people and we tra we trained together at, there used to be a um a vander Holyfield at a gym by uh, Atlanta Airport, a Gold's Gym. And we all stayed at a hotel by the, like, I think Davey was living in Tampa at the time. We all used to stay at this hotel when I first came here, right uh, by the airport, the Ramadra Hotel in, in, uh, in Atlanta. And we used to go to the gym together, the, which was a Vander Olafield's gym. Um, or at least I think he, well, I, I don't know if he owned it, but he was always in there. He Davey must there. have been something else in that gym. Yeah. And see, you know, I, I was never, we've talked, I think we've mentioned this once. I was always a conditioning person. I did weight train, but when I was 22, my diving days ended. I did a dive once over the top rope and I ripped my shoulder out of the socket. So I went to a strictly get ground game from then onwards. You ever wonder where my styles, if I could have kept diving, I'd have probably ended up with a lot shorter career and a lot more injuries. Although, but, but by the time I got to America at 24, I'd learned that I was a strictly ground game person only. So, you know, yeah, you, yeah. I might, you go back and think, oh, he's a bit of an old fashioned style. It was through necessity to keep, to stay in the wrestling business. Safety first. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'd learned that I couldn't do that. <laughs> right. Then I broke my neck and you know, and it just goes on and on. This shoulder was never right after, after when I was 22, it was never quite right. But I remember doing bench, we were in the, in, in the gym in, in Atlanta. I remember David doing some ridiculous bench presses and I could just about struggle two plates out, but it's cause this shoulder used to just not just, just like no strength in it. Right. Uh, well, neck. after, after right. that is when I broke my neck, which even added more to this cause there was nerve damage in it. So I, I used to just do like sort of lightweight training, but always did me in do pushups and squats and whatever else right. and a wheel, wheel and stuff. I was always about conditioning and about Davies go, yeah. go. So we and had that match that uh, it's just why I'm on this train of thought. We had it this was, match and it was right. very different. I know my friend Rob Naylor said it was like a, one of the big eye opening things for him because he, He'd never really seen no, that style. At I saw time, him say you know? that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was one thing that went wrong in that match and, um, I wouldn't say went wrong, but it, it, it it's not right. Uh, just, uh, and that was, I, it, I'm not going to say why, but there's one thing that I, w I wasn't happy with in that match. Um, and there's a quite a bit, it's better on gifts than it is to actually watch it. In my opinion, um, there was one thing went wrong and then there was another thing that happened to Davy boy that I had to hold him on the ground a lot for, for a while. And I don't want to say too much, but you'll see there's one, there's one 
thing where he gives me goes to give me a reverse monkey flip off the ropes, and it, there was something went wrong in his leg, and he and he went halfway with me, and I couldn't. In, in, when you do that, you have to actually catapult somebody like that. Sure. And he, his leg sort of went. It, it cramped up as we went up in the air like that. And so he sort of stopped, his legs stopped there. And I, I sort of tried to push myself off and I sort of land on the back of my shoulder, but then I had to sort of hold him down while he got the, the movement back in his leg. And I'm not sure exactly what that was all about, but um, so until he got, got like, he's gone, okay, okay. So there's a point in that match where we have to sort of stay down on the floor for quite a while for him to get some feeling back. I don't think I've even told Larry that story, but that, 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 and now I'm thinking about it. There was, the, yeah, there was a bit where he went, you can, and you can see because he just stopped his leg, stop off where there was something it was either his hip or his leg. But he, he was just saying, just stay here a second. And he, he, there was something with his leg. We had to sort of get get through it anyway. But then once he once he got the feeling back, we carried on with the with, with the end of the match because we hadn't talked about anything. We just so it was we were just doing stuff and out there. It went to a 15 minute draw. Yeah. Um. Your next uh. Your next, you know, big match. Of course, you wrestled every TV. You wrestled every house show. We have what they called at the times, and 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 you know, uh, Tony Khan is kind of bringing this thing back with the Battle of the Belts thing. Is a clash of the champions. You were clash of the champions twenty five, and you didn't do a draw this time. Unlike uh, a lot of the matches, uh, this one was you defeated uh, Johnny B. Bad, and of course, we all know Johnny B. Bad. Mark Marrows had one of the best post wrestling careers. Uh, uh, of that you can imagine of people. He's an inspirational speaker yep. now. Yep. At the time, Lovely Dusty fellow. saw him and Lovely said, fellow. I want you to be <laughs> Little Richard. Yeah. And so he had this Little Richard thing, but yeah. he worked it like it worked. What was it like working with a young Mark Marrow slash Johnny B. Bab? Um, I always liked him and I got on with him. And because it was a different day and age and if you came from when I came f f in the job, um, older wrestler or villain led the match. And so it, I just led the match. And so we, it, we, we, we had some, I thought we had some, for his skill level at the time, I thought we had some good matches. Um, we all, we were always good opponents. It, you wrestled each other a bit. It was, yes, you know, yes, yeah. we wrestled each other. He was up. in that yeah. group, uh, and he was still he was trying to learn. You know, he was you know him been wrestling long, and he, he was, was thrown in right in the deep end. Mm -hmm. I can say this: if you see who he's on with, though, he's on with Arns, Steve Austin's, Bob Eaton's, Ricky Steamboat, right? Yeah, people that that could could help him through a match, and and and. Uh, that's no knock on him in any way, but I'm sure he knows that knows that now. I don't know how he felt at the time if he thought he, but there's a reason the people he was on with, he was put on with. It was because we could help him through the and and know how to make the the most of him and, and make him look as good as he looked. As a, I hope, he, I hope he it doesn't take that as a, as a knock in any way, but it, he, he needed guidance when he was yeah. in there he he's pretty honest and self-deprecating when it comes to his wrestling career you know he's he's very good at, at he talks to kids a lot inspiring speaker go ahead and look him up look up what mark marrow's doing um speaking of uh i was and, and i i liked him a lot in fact as a person right yeah he lived he lived above me in, a, in an apartment we lived in the same apartments this this infamous le park apartments um next to sting and lex luger's gym um and i it, it we actually got on really well. He, I, I remember the day he came down to my room when he first signed with WWE and told me told me he got a contract and how much money it was. It was because he, he was the first person to ever get a guaranteed contract from WWE. Oh, well, that's your first contract. mistake, right? You shouldn't be telling people what. No, but he, he, I think he just confided it. You know, he told me that. But I, I was I was happy for him because I liked him. You know, like we 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 had one little incident once and that was uh, with the mr anoki thing um there was just a little and not um he probably don't even remember it it was like a little thing but it was just me knowing that i i don't think he realized how serious and how who mr anoki was 
and I'd, I'd asked him not to shoot the the the, the gun thing off. Right, the confetti, uh, the yeah, confetti cannon. Then, right, and the first thing he did was shoot it off all over the ring, and I was covered in these big silver things, and knowing that I had to do this thing with Mister and Okie afterwards, and and it, and it wasn't anything. That, I mean, that was the slightest thing that we ever had a, a bit of. I might might have said something to him afterwards, and nothing, nothing of any. Consequence, well, but every every we got on very well. And we used to go to the power plant together, and I used to I used to like wrestling him because he, he would listen, and it, people loved him. And so, when you're a villain, and you've got it, it doesn't matter anybody's whatever the person was. If you've got a a, a baby face that people love, and you're comfortable as a villain and you can go like that, and they'll go and they'll go like that back, and you can go oh. You're off there to the races. Is. There it is. That's and, all this job's about, really. And um, he was. And we, uh, we, we make it complicated. So it, it was great when I when I wrestled it. I, I we always had good matches. And and it's it's a lesson, I guess, about character too. He was all in on the character. All and in, when you're yeah. all in on a character, it makes it easy to work. Yeah. Uh, easier to work, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, with that character uh, coming up uh, after this. You participated in uh, in a Starcade as TV champion in what is known as the lethal lottery, the battle bowl, and mm. <laughs> which is, uh, you know, the randomized tag teams. And uh, do you remember much of this? It was you tagging with Ricky Steamboat against Paul Orndorff and the Shockmaster. Okay, so now I can tell this is a story. So D Dusty was incredible to me. He loved Lord Stephen Regal, right? And we, you know, Dusty was absolutely wonderful always me and him got on you know i've told the story from day one was a <laughs> i've known him from day one I, that I, I turned up at tv in america and we became very close and especially the like obviously the last few years of his life we became very very close um and i just a joke with him at that time for for whatever like because i i if you go back and look, I, I beat everybody at that time. I, I was the, you know, like, because I was whatever I was, right? I was the TV champion. I was beating it, all these people or doing draws with them anyway. I, you know, I was I was getting really, really looked after. But he, he had this thing that he he, he was trying to help uh, Fred out, Shockmaster, because it obviously hadn't played out the way they wanted to. They tried to make the most of it. And I, Obviously, couldn't beat me in a singles match. If I remember rightly, this is where he gets to beat me, right? Is that the the, the outcome of this match? Uh, I, I I think you lost the tag team match. You uh, wrestled yes. you wrestled later that night against Ricky Steamboat, but in the tag team match, you lost the tag team. Match. I lost it, and if I'm rightly, Fred beat me, right? Shock yeah. Master beat. Fred. Yeah. yeah. So I used to, the, Dusty was set on getting Fred a win over me. And uh, that was the way he did it. Was in that match. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was just a, a, an odd pair in a match. Uh, um, and I should go back and watch that because I, I, one of the few times I would have got to do anything with Paul Orndorff, and I was, I, I, I'm I, such a huge Paul Orndorff fan as, as a wrestler, not, and 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 my friend as well. You know, like we we, we at that time, me and him were we used to hang out a lot and and just get, i got on with him so well he was he was so he was so helpful to me when when i was younger like just and i was able to pass on those well wishes to travis yeah. uh his son and he yeah. passed them back to you and then yeah, yeah. said how much uh his dad thought of you as well yeah yeah we get we got on really 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 well and he, so that would would be the only time i th think that I, I did anything actually got to do anything wrestling wise with him i'm not sure if we even touched in that match if i because you know there's that many matches and uh, it, right it's, and it's, it's set up with a lot of you know uh people that don't want to lock up you know because it's a randomized tag, randomized team tag match yeah yeah um and you also wrestled ricky steamboat again and uh defeated him uh in that starcade and of course uh as this shows by the time you hear this, uh, it's still coming up the last weekend in November, Thanksgiving weekend. I believe Ricky Steamboat's having his last match in Raleigh, North Carolina. Y'all can look it up if you want to go. I might be going. I'll be in Winston-Salem that weekend, so I might go to Raleigh. Uh, but you end up starting 1994 with uh, Dustin Rhodes 
the young Dustin Rhodes, man, what, when you talk about the word blue chipper, they used a lot about him, but he certainly was. He he was like a, he was like a puppy with big paws. Like he had everything you knew he was going to be like one of the greatest wrestlers in the world. And we had from, uh, I first met him in 1991 when I, I've told that story before, but I ended up working with WCW in England for five days and we got on great. And so. I wrestled him a lot. Once I became Lord Stephen, I wrestled him quite a bit on a lot of live events. In fact, the first, the, the infamous tour when um, the, the night that the, the Sid and uh, Arn Anderson um, thing happened and yeah. I wasn't there because I'd gone home to Blackpool, um, we were 20 miles away the, the next night in, in, in Blackburn and I turn up there and then I find out about the Sid and Arn incident that had happened that night, at, you know, early hours of that morning. I wrestled Dustin that night. It's funny things that jog your memory, but I wrestled Dustin in Blackburn that night. Sure. Um, Robbie Rookside was there. Just things that have come into... As, it, was, it's was funny, good. the things in memory are either yeah. things that are really good or really yeah. bad. Yeah. They're the things that kind of stick out, yeah. you know? Um, and me and Dustin always went out there and, and, and right until my last days in in uh, as a wrestler in wwe we, we, we'd done some very memorable things together so, some my, my favorite thing i ever did in wwe uh, as far as entertainment was the 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 las vegas show girls the dressing yeah and that, yeah. i i i absolutely <laughs> got to do, i got to do two things like that with dustin one was where we dressed up as each other but the 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 showgirl thing was the, my favorite because if you're a, a study uh, British comedy the way that I have uh, old British comedy, I do little bits as, as tributes to all the people that have had an influence of me all the way down the ramp as I'm doing my little things and then little bits, even in, in the match at the end of it, there's a little bit of, I'm not going to say who because I, but if you know what you're looking at, there's little tributes to because once I got told that, I was like, people were like, you sure you can? I thrive on that stuff. It's, I thrive on doing comedy. And I get, I, just, I, I thought, what a perfect way to, to finally, whether you know, if you know what you're looking at, there's all these little bits, and Tommy Cooper and Larry Grace and then Hilda Baker and, and, and little peep, peep things that are, I've, I've sort of studied these British comedians and, 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 that there's little bits of it anyway in that in that particular thing but Dustin me and him always hit it off one of my favorite ever moments in wrestling was against Dustin in uh Nîmes in France uh for WWE on a tour and it is a Roman Colosseum that was built by it's in southern France and it's where denim comes from where what? yes from Denim means from Neem. Oh, wow. And Denim. Uh, so there's a Roman Colosseum there. And it is on, all, obviously, Col Colosseums were built for acoustic quality. For sure. And we were on first. And I grabbed all the, this is not, I don't know, not too many years ago, 12, 13, whatever years ago. It, when I say that, that to, to a young person sounds a long time, you know, to our age, it's, it's, it's like nothing. That. And we were on this tour and we just, we locked up and I grabbed his arm and I just held it because it held it, pushed him to the floor with his wrist holding his, I'm stood up and I've got, he's on his knees and I've got him by the shoulder and the wrist and he, the people are going insane just from the big, the beginning and the acoustics, it's, it's like, you can actually feel it like. Right, Coming all that sound bouncing off yeah. that rock is just. And he yeah. tried to he tried to get up off of, off the floor, he, like he wanted to start moving about. And I went, "Don't move!" I said, "Stay there. It's never going to get any better than this." Oh, that's awesome! Because it was the we were just just in from the simplest of things to the simplest of things before, and the people were going insane, and you could actually feel the vibrations through to your bones. And I said, "It's never going to get any better than this," and just like take a look around and he looked around and I looked around and you like, okay, now start coming up. And then we started going into the match. It, it, it was just like, a, I've never felt anything like it in my life. Any, any, cause most of the stadiums you ever do, like the few times I did WrestleMania, I didn't like it. 
and there's people will tell you that you can't hear anything because they're so big and the fans that the actual stands are so far away you like both times i did wrestlemania open open matches i come out thinking it was absolutely awful and like quit and actually a few times that i would i was going up and going oh i'm so i'm sorry and they're going why i, I was going because it was just it was just nothing happening you can't when you're in, in that in the middle of the thing you couldn't hear anybody i don't right. know why just the acoustics aren't weren't right right and, uh, so I, I only ever did two of those really big stadium shows but i couldn't hear anything and it was just like really awkward when you got no noise and no nothing to work off as a wrestler everything feels not right it, it didn't to me anyway even even as a fan the yeah. outdoor arenas i've been you know all the to the manias that my son and i've gone to it, it, it there's no comparison to being a building that has a roof that contains that sound you know well let me tell you the romans had figured out better than anybody 2000 years ago how to how to acoustically build a building right for 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 the for for the major so and you know the, you actually read about history you, you'll learn a lot of that was a lot like pro wrestling <laughs> very much so it was yeah, yeah. it was yeah you know, you, was a lot, it would a have lot to be because they would run out of workers in like a right, <laughs> a right. Couple and times. it's all it's all about putting a show on right right and, and right maximizing the effect of everything right uh, well of course after uh, beating Ricky Steamboat at Starcade. We have uh, another Clash of the Champions where you, as we talked about, faced Dustin Rhodes. You had Arn Anderson at Super Brawl. And then you did a series of matches. Can I just so, say something sure. about the Arn Anderson at Super that, That's sure. number 94, right? Yes, uh, February that, 94. Yeah, And that's the third, that's the 29-minute something. Yes. Right. So I will tell this story quickly. Arn is the person to ask about this because he tells this his way and I tell it mine. Um, but it's both the same stories. Arn, um, at the time, didn't expect to, he, th he thought, oh, it's just because I was on a big role. Um, he was expecting eight to 12 minute match. He went out the night before <laughs> And, and no no that's impossible and that's and a, uh so wonder i wasn't but I, I wouldn't at that time I, I wasn't going out i was i was strictly sick it wasn't until a year later when i started going out with him so <laughs> that's when that's when uh the the my that life's not started. for everybody yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the time this is 94 and i i didn't drink and i wasn't doing anything i, I think I, I but anyway i wasn't going out because I, I knew you know, I was always ready to go. Um, well, Arn goes out and he gets in at very late hours or early hours of the morning. Um, well into Sunday morning. And he turns up and the actual match is neat, basically a 30-minute draw. So he, he said, I'll be back later. And he disappears and goes to the gym to get a sweat on. Uh, and we yeah. have absolutely nothing. We, we, we have, we, we, and I, I don't like, you know, I, I'm, we've gone through this, but I, I, I think there's only me and Arn still care about this, but it, it's worth, you know, everybody else knows. The, he knew that we could go through 12, 15 minutes in a sleep. We, we've we've seen, me and him wrestled each other so many times we we, we didn't even need to talk. But thirty minutes is thirty minutes, and so what? He was like, okay, when he came back, what we're we gonna do? Uh, well, we knew what we was doing at the very end, and so I said to him, let's just go out and and register for each other, and. I will never say that this match is a fantastic match. What I will say is if you are a young wrestler, if you want to learn detailed how to sell, uh, react and make every single every single thing you do mean something, watch this match and study it. Because we make the most out of every single thing 
to drag it out over 30 minutes. But every single thing is meaning meant something. And the, 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 it's, it's, it's that close up card magic stuff. The slightest of just everything is, there's nothing. It's, no hole. It's all, there's no holes in it. It's all very credible. All, and it might, again, it's, it's a, a drawn out thing. And I don't, I'm not worried about, but it was my job to do a, a certain, it wasn't my job to steal the show. It was my job to go out and do credible wrestling. Um, which is hard for people to know, that, but it, you know, there's times when you used it, to get told that go out and just we want some we want people focused in on this. And, and to put in context, this match was longer than any other two matches combined, longer right. than the previous three matches combined. Right. This is this is an outlier in WCW at the time, and also an outlier on this card for sure. Yeah, but it isn't to steal the show; it's to go out and just have a credible match, and. We go out there and every, from the beginning to the end, if you want to really break it down and study the, the little nuances of how to, to get the most out of everything in this job, I don't like the word selling. I, I prefer, you, you all start off selling. When you learn to react, then your, your wrestling becomes better. This is a masterclass in reacting, this match. So I'm, that's that's what I'm going to say about this match. So, so definitely check it out, guys. Uh, if, Super Bowl. If you, if you are a wrestler and, and you are wanting to learn how to the nuances of how to react in wrestling, but yes. fans like stuff like that too. Like that interests me as a fan as well. You know, to see pro wrestling as as a kid as it draws you in as this fascinating you know superhero show. But as you get older. You start learning things like this, and you go, how are these guys doing that? And when you see that you guys are reacting, you know, just watching you a steamboat, you know, watching you react to stuff so quickly, there's a time where uh, in, in your steamboat match that I saw today where you went for a double leg or something. I don't think he knew it. He went for a kick, and in real time, he softened up that kick. And I was thinking, wow, like these guys are reacting in real time and not, you know, it's it's an amazing thing for us fans to see as well. So. Of course, if you're trying to be a wrestler, but for you fans who want to really see what's going on and think you know what's going on, watch that match. It's Super Brawl 4, 1994. I um, always know that, that it, it, which is very difficult for a younger town, but this is a good thing to know. We never laid anything of this out. <laughs> we would just go out there with knowing what was happening at the end. And if I if spent more than three minutes talking about any match over 30 minutes that I've ever done in my life. You're not, you're not writing it out on yellow legal pads before. No, and nothing yeah. wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It just wasn't the way that I was taught. Right. People, you know, people criticize matches for not doing that now, but I know no, what you're I saying. Don't. I, I don't. It's just right. different, different, different ways. If it works, it works. Things. If right. it works, it works. I, right. You're not going to hear that from me. I'm not nope. one of them old wrestlers. It's just, that's the way I was taught and that's, and, and the people I was on with, that's the way they preferred to do it. And if you wrestle me, that was the way I did it. Because another thing, I couldn't remember it. If you studied then, because you, you, I just wasn't the way I was taught. So I, and luckily, because I was usually the more experienced wrestler or the villain, I got to lead the tempo. So if there's, yeah, my, right. I've told you before, my, my career looks far better in gifts. When you just see that, because there's a lot of like pacing and, and, but also, and I'm not making excuses, but also knowing that this isn't working right today. Oh, this isn't working right today. My knee's not got, so I can't go at 100 mile an hour today, but I can still do my job and sure. keep everybody happy and keep a job in wrestling, <laughs> right? It's not about being the best bout machine. It's not about being what, whatever. That's, that was never, I never thought about that. It was being a pro and doing my job and having a career and keeping the people paying me happy. That's why I how we started this i'd never right. read i've never ever read a, a critique of any of my matches because i and never I, I because that i just what, what okay well if you didn't like it you didn't like it I, i'm sorry it's too late i've done it now what, what can i do right that's that's, that's right. my my thing it's no knock on it it's just that's just the way it is with me i don't and to improve 
you're going to listen to the people that you listen to. You don't need to listen yeah. Cause you're, you have well, access to know, the greatest people fired. in the world. Right. <laughs> right. So you didn't get fired because what happened is something I'm, I'm not aware of until this very moment is there was a series that made, looks like about two weeks called battle stars, 1994, which is in Germany. It was, it was two weeks of, of wrestling in Germany. There's a day one, day two, day three, you had a bunch of matches. Uh, one of the matches is Ricky Steamboat and sting versus you and Ric Flair. Yeah. You wrestled Max Payne. You tagged with Ron Simmons. You tagged with Flair again. You wrestled Flair, but you defended the TV title one time in this. Uh, not in it when you say these names out and you go. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Like, and I'm just 20 odds. And I, I, like, I think we said it on the last podcast. If you actually put the list of names up of people, there'd be nobody. I, I, and that's not me trying to say. There'd be nobody ever has, has had the list because of so many countries and before I came to America that will have all, all the times that I was fortunate enough to be around, like the attitude here and well, the end of it. And then into the, the, the list of names and, and, and high rank, like big star names that I've been fortunate enough to be in the ring with it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It, How's that happened to me? How's that happened to a lad that used to want to just be a wrestler? And basically all I am is just a, I'm, I'm, I'm just a journeyman a journey, wrestler. Head wrestler right. That's what I am. Right. I, and I'm nothing special, but I just could, I'm, I'm a d good pro. I could do my job. But if you look at the list of the names of the people I've been on with and fortunate enough to be on with and been around, and uh, it's, it's unbelievable. You've just said that Ron Simmons, uh, uh, you know, I've wrestled Ron quite a few times before he went to the WWE. We always had good matches. You know, I, I remember wrestling Ron one night and uh, Harley Race was my, my manager for some reason. Right on, on on a live event because I, I think it should have been Big Bubba or or Vader or something. Or Vader or somebody. Yeah. yeah, and I ended up and Ollie was my manager one night, and then Ollie was my manager against. Oh, oh sorry, that's I'm getting confused. It was because Vader was something wrong with him, and and Harley was there was a, a another night on that in that time period. Harley was my manager against. Um, it was the Guardian Angel at the time, but um, Big Boss Man, Bubba, Big Boss Man. Yeah, you know, like just things that. Who else is, can say that? Who's it it was my age and, and had all these incredible... And it's not about me. It's about... I'm a fan of wrestling. I, I was a fan when I was a kid. How did all this happen to me? Yeah, the it, list of people it, who wrestled uh, Monoki and Encina is short. Right. It's like a <laughs> char know? just a charmed life. Just, I've, yeah. had a, I've had nothing but a charmed existence out of this wonderful job. Well, I think part of the charmed life is, is getting to know... You had one title defense is getting to know this guy. Uh, this is someone we haven't talked about a lot, someone near and dear to my heart as a, as an adult fan and just someone I think the world of, uh, you wrestled for the TV title one cactus Jack. Uh, right. tell us, tell us a little bit about, Where was that in Germany? That was in the Germany in the two All week. Right. And, and let's see if I can pronounce this name in Germany. It is, um, oh man, the venue is Stadthal Rostock Sh in Mech. Stand yes, up. yeah, in Mecklenburg Vorpommern, Vor oh. Vorpommern. But I yeah, I don't have no idea what that one is, but yeah. I know it's a Stadthalle. So, um, so right, it is a quick one for you. I was there the night that his ear came off, and Gary Michael Capetta came walking in the dressing room with his ear in his hand, and I wished I could say I picked it up and sang into it. <laughs> I wish I could, <laughs> but Gary Michael Competter came. It was in Germany. He came walking into the dressing room with like with, with a, a like ashen face like that. And got and he had his he had he had, he had cactus's ear in it. Well, what what bit of his ear he had in his hand? And I did go up and touch it. I did go up and I poked the I poked the bit of st stuff on his ear, that his ear. So I, I I can say I I did that. I didn't. I I wished I could tell you that I could make a better story and say I picked it up and sang into it like Michael Madsen in 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 uh, Reservoir Dogs. But no. But I did touch the ear in in Michael Capet in Gaddy Michael Capetta's hand. Yeah. So uh, I, and that you you've actually shot me. There. I didn't think I ever wrestled Cactus until uh, I thought I only wrestled him in a singles match once, and that was in the Bahamas. I know I wrestled him in the Bahamas in a in a outside. Like it might be a baseball stadium with about fifty people there, which was. You remember the story when we ended up oh, yeah. flying back and we ended up on the the beach. Me, Austin, and and me, Steve, and and Cactus. Well, the night before, we we wrestled each other in the Bahamas. There was about fifty people in this in this stadium, 
and there was nobody there um and then that went on there so okay you're telling me something i i completely so, forgot that i on, wrestled cactus jack in germany on the you oh. wrestled him a couple times uh oh, right. for on day one you wrestled him in a oh. non-title match day uh seven or excuse me day let's see what day is that day five you wrestled him for the title and oh. on day nine he lost his ear right so that was the same, this is the same tour. Maybe it's the uh, traumatic experience of uh, everything was overshadowed by the fact that right, right, that's your memory the came it's, off. is the ear is yeah. touching the ear. I can't remember this. I can't remember this. This I remember being in Germany when his ear come off. I remember being on, I can't remember this superstar battle bowl, double. So double, are you, whatever it is. Are you trying to tell me that for some reason? You remember touching Mick Foley's decapitated ear yeah. more than you remember wrestling. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, excuse sorry. me, Johnny B. Bad the same night. Right. Yeah. So, sorry to all those involved, but yeah. Well, you, you know, there's not many times you get to touch like your, your friend's ear in in and uh, you know I, I love Gary Michael Capetta uh, and and it, it was just a mad scene, you know. Like I'm <laughs> I'm just in the dressing room and I go, oh, what's that? And I'm, I'm poking his ear. I love so I Fol to, Foley's I best quote. Ripped off here. Foley's best quote from it. I'll never forget it from his book. He's like, "As I struggled for the German word for formaldehyde." Oh, that's you another know? thing. Yeah. <laughs> See, is 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 a little tidbit for you. Um, you might have read this, but I do. What I do remember is being on those tours and and Cactus cutting promos in German because he speaks pretty fluent German. Which was so you know amazing he, for the for the audience. He learned German. No, no, he, I think no, he, 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 he he studied at you know in college or whatever. Okay, he he he, he, he spoke German. But spoke I remember German him talking about me, and I I used to work there all the time. He felt it was a wasted opportunity for WCW not to utilize his nice. German more on these tours was, and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I I've seen I, I've I, now I'm I remember I'm, I've actually seen him in the ring doing um, um, German promos. You know, I was in China when when John Cena turned up. We were doing a tryout and and did a ten minute speech in Mandarin. Unbelievable, just unbelievable. And I'd watch, I'd watch. This is when you know I got to talk about the, nobody can say a bad word about John Cena to me. I, I used to see him for, for quite a while because we was on so many shows together with cards and and I'd, well, you know, I'm learning Mandarin. Well, I've done I've done one thing where he it, like after show things and stuff. No, but I got to be on so many shows with John. But I used to see him look, with these cards. That's what it. As soon as he got to the building, he's signing five hundred photographs, doing doing radio interviews over the phone. And and learning never never not sat and watched every. This is for any young wrestler who's not watching matches and never not watched every single match that was that was on, from the beginning to the end, and in in any spare time that he had, sat reading cards, learning learning Mandarin, and then I was there the day that he turned up. I mean, he's done a film. He went over there and done a film with Jackie Chan, right? But turned up and did a 10 minute speech in mandarin right mick so that was that's off topic but that's how much commitment if you want to be a top wrestler in this job and, and he carries that through the rest of his life i don't know if you've seen the show life. peacemaker did you see peacemaker no. his tv show but my man played piano for real on right. peacemaker of course he, he played like yeah. he played this beautiful version of yeah. home sweet home by motley the, Crue, it's, it's and it was him playing you know yeah. he's yeah of course it, he would I that's mean, a great le lesson for young wrestlers too is right. that's, you know that, that's that's that you larry to... bird type work ethic or any right. kind of great athlete that work right. ethic you know a different league of, of kind of everything just and anyway but yeah cactus cactus used to do at the end of when we were in germany he would always get on the mic and do a, a you know a, a promo in german which endeared him immensely to the to the the crowd so yeah I, I so i'd forgot it's a shame that i forgot that that i, I wrestled him on those tours but i did i i did get to poke his ear <laughs> well there that's some you probably touched his ear after <laughs> like he did you know like you you might have been one of the last people to actually uh touch mick foley's ear yeah yeah um someone we don't talk a lot about and we should because i think this guy was ahead of his time i i don't know if we we talked about it much at all uh alex wright you wrestled him wcw saturday yeah. night yeah. in in a defense he got some gold eventually he was someone that may have been a few years ahead of his time but he seemed to have all the tools wcw seemed to like him what was alex a young and he was young what was alex wright like uh, as a young wrestler well i knew his dad 
uh, his dad was very famous uh, European wrestler, uh, Steve Wright. Steve Wright was, the f I believe, the first person to be ta taught by a ra old wrestler and incredible trainer called Ted Betley. Ted Betley went on to train Dynamite Kid, Davy Boy Smith, John Smith, Johnny Smith. That's right. I read about him in Dynamite's book. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Well, Steve Wright was his original protege, as far as I know. I don't, uh, it, but he was his, you know, everybody knew there was a big connection with Steve and um, Ted Betley. Um, so I, I knew Alex through that. Um, Alex started, as far as I know, he'd only had a couple of matches. Um, one against Finlay, one against um, PCO, Carl um, Ouellette, um in Germany. He had a couple of matches in Germany in 92 when I was there. In 93, um, WCW, actually, I, I, I don't know if he knows this, uh, but I, it's not like... I, the, G Germany had, had WCW TV on, uh, and they wanted a German star. Uh, and they said to me, do you know anybody from Germany? And they mentioned one name and I went, all right. I said, well, but this fellow was in his forties and I didn't say anything, but he was also a bit hard work. I won't, I won't say it is cause he's no longer with us, but he was right. a bit hard work. Right. There wasn't too many German wrestlers at the time. But he was high maintenance, kind of? Uh, um, he just hard work. Okay. And he was a huge, and I mean a huge, big German, and he was just a bit hard work. And I, I knew, I never said anything about him, but, but I knew the only person who'd end up wrestling him would be Muggins here. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I knew him and I'd wrestled him before. Right. I knew that... Uh, he, was, he was in his 40s anyway, and I knew he wouldn't want to lose to anybody because it was just the way he was. And I knew that, that there'd be... So I didn't say anything, but I said, there's this young lad. Um, he hasn't done a lot. He hasn't had many matches, but let's have a look at him. So we, when we're in Germany, Steve, right, and uh, brings Alex along and... Was it me that wrestled him or I, f I forget, I sub whoever, next thing, Ric Flair sees him. I, I could have all this a little bit jumbled up, loves him, Alex is in America and he's only had an handful of matches. Right. And the, he's, this is in April 21st of 1994. Right. You, you, the German tour ended March 20th, 1994. So right. not, not too much longer than that. Um, he's, he's had a handful of matches and he had, he had some in 93 as well on, in the German tournaments. But you know, like I'd, I, I was in America by then. In '92, he had he had a couple of matches. That that was the beginning. He, he was like 18 or so. Well, I for, forget all. He was only young, and one of them was. I I, I didn't wrestle him then because I was a, a a baby face in Germany. But I know Fit wrestled him. I know Carl uh, Ouellette, the uh, PCO wrestled him. Um, and then he had a couple in. He had some some matches in '93. I wasn't there for. Whenever this conversation came up with the German, it was the German uh, actual TV people, I, and I was there. They asked me, they said, what about such and such? And I went, there is this other lad. That's all I said. I didn't block this fella in any way, but I just went, there's Steve Wright's lad who was born in Germany. He's, you know, he's not like Steve was born in England and, and moved to Germany and lived in Germany, still does. And, I mean, and to your credit as, as a future scout, you know, uh, Alex yeah. Wright, literally yeah. on paper, had everything, everything he wanted, everything. He had youth, he had yeah, size, he had athleticism. Yeah. He was, you know, he had a yeah. good look, everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah, and and you know, and and his dad was unbelievable. If you've never seen his dad, watch. There's a Steve Wright against Tiger Mask. It's the it's the only match that if you watch any other Tiger match, Tiger Mask matches, original Tiger Mask, it's about Tiger Mask. When he's on with Steve, Steve <laughs> was so good, he just out wrestles him. It, it's there's it a uh, Steve is an excellent wrestler. If you didn't take anything from Steve, you, you just didn't get it. Right. He would out wrestle right. you. He just right. and he what he didn't he did you know Steve could do this like he was the real deal. He, right. He, he could. Uh, like, but if you didn't take the first time I ever wrestled him in 1989 in Bremen, I came out the ring 
And Dave Taylor looked at me and said, are you thirsty? And I said, what do you mean? He went, well, you never got a drink of water in there, did you? Basically, you didn't, you didn't get anything. Uh, so you learn, oh, I've got to take. Uh, and, and a lot of wrestlers were like that. If you, you, right. Like Finley was like, if you didn't, it, you give you an opening. If you didn't do something, they just kept doing their stuff. And it was like not trying to be. It was just the way it was. They weren't. Well, there's let, there's no was, pauses in a real fight. Either, yeah, right, right, right. Well, Steve, if you watch the match, it, 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 it's quite a infamous match. If if you study Tiger Mask career, but Steve got over like a, a million dollars. But really, it sh he should have been there to get Tiger Mask over. But it ended up being Steve. Just he just there's a, this incredible. It was it was incredible. Just did all this fancy, brilliant wrestling. But and Tiger Mask basically ends up just holding his wrist for the entire match. So it's an incredible match. But I've somebody mis misconstrued. Is misconstrued the right word I'm looking for? I, misconstrued. I, misconstrued. I said this about on Steve Aust Austin's podcast years ago, and somebody misconstrued this because I said it. Oh yeah, it didn't get a drink of water in it because that's the way. It, it's an old European pro thing about saying. He didn't get a break. He didn't get a break. He just right. didn't. It, it, it ended up the Steve Wright match and not, right. the, not the Tiger Mask match um, because Steve just showed everybody how brilliant he was. And that's the way he wrestled. And Millie Zerno was the same. There's a lot of people like that with this. You know, right. them fellas from a different day and age. If you didn't take, they didn't give you. And that was it. And that was how I got brought up with a lot of the wrestlers I wrestled. Fit Vinland, we've talked about that. If you didn't take it, you didn't give it you. You just... You know, Marty Jones was a son who trained me. Like, he wouldn't, if you didn't take his stuff, it, they, they just made sure the match looked good and they looked good. And, and, and they made you look good, but it, it ended up more in their favor, if that makes any sense. Um, so young Alex was there, and, 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 I, and, and, and I said, What about this lad? Because he's young and he's not going to be, you know, he, he's going to fit right in and he's good looking and whatever else. Cause that, the, the other person I did mention was, um, a friend of mine, Franz Schumann, but Franz Schumann was Austrian. And they said, no, um, we want a German because German, you know, as much as we want to think the world is, you know, the way it is at, at the time, I don't know what it's like now. There's, right. There was a bit of a strange thing with Germans and Austrians. I don't Still, know. yeah. Yeah, right. They wanted a German and not an Austrian, playing a German, right? Right. Because it right. was on their, it was their call because they had, they had, as you notice, there's a lot of, there was a lot of German tours at that time. And you've got Bischoff in now who's trying to expand in the worldwide yeah. and trying to find people yeah. to represent in different yeah. areas. And, and he knows, he's smart enough to know, if yeah. you pass off an Austrian as a German, that's yeah. not going to work so great for the German audience. Yeah. I can also tell you another story about that. Alex wasn't, because of his style, he wasn't fitting in very well. And we were in Chicago one night. The old, what's the old, the old I don't know what it was called then, but it might, it might still be in the old state. I don't know if it's even called that now, but, you know, the old state arena. And I watched, Alex, and I watched, Eric was stood, and it, I was stood on the balcony watching him and he, he, he was a bit down on it because he, he wasn't fitting in very well because uh, he, he, his style was different and he was young and he, 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 he didn't cut. We got to TV to the next, because uh, Ric Flair loved, saw the potential and loved him. This is, and this is absolute truth. Ric Flair was the, the, the booker at the time. Rick loved him, saw the potential in him, knew the young ladies were, you know, looked at him like that, as, him as a baby face. When we got to TV, I asked to do, I asked Eric, I said, can I have a dark match with Alex, please? Because Eric was, he might remember this different. I remember this crystal because it was Alex, you know, and I, I obviously, because his dad, you know, was a big thing to me and his dad was very helpful to me and, 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 and I learned a lot wrestling his dad. Um, I said, can I have a dark match? And I had a dark match at centre stage with Alex. Well, I knew Alex, Alex is, I knew, obviously, he was a European wrestler. I knew all of Alex's dad's stuff. And I knew Alex knew all of Alex's dad's stuff, which is like, you don't see many Europe, Americans ever do the flying ankle scissors. Have you ever seen that one? It's like a, you ankle scissors somebody and it, it, this. So I oh, knew yeah, all that. Definitely, right? yeah. So, I I went out there with Alex and did all the all of his dad's stuff. Basically, Alex just did his dad's stuff, and we came 
as soon as we walked through the cur curtain, Eric Bischoff was thought Alex was the greatest thing in the world. So I kept, and I'm not trying to put anything on Alex. Eric wasn't very high on, on Alex at the time. I asked for a dark match with him at centre stage. He might not remember this, but it's the truth. And I put Alex, I, I flew all over for Alex and did all this stuff and we and made him and that was it. And that's what kept Alex in America because right. Eric Eric had told me he was ready for getting rid of him. Showed Eric a different side of him. Showed yes. him what what he could do. Of course, you had a few other matches in '94. We're probably going to talk to talk about when we talk about your second reign as WCW. Uh, TV champion. We're going to finish we'll have off because we're gonna. It's, it's gonna be Christmas soon, isn't it? Yeah. So we're gonna close out just by talking about <laughs> uh, in in uh, Fall Brawl '94, a year, uh, a year to the not to the day, but to the event of Fall Brawl '94. You lose the title to someone we talked about earlier. You talked about earlier how some usually it was the the workers' title, but sometimes they would use the title to kind of elevate some people. Yes. And yes. and that's I think what the purpose was here to give some credibility to to young Johnny B. Bad. Yep. Um yep. what are your memories about I know it probably didn't bother you to lose the title, but you remember being told, okay, it's time to drop well, it or what is, you're doing next or this this is where the one time that me and Mark had a little incident. Hmm. So the night that I did the angle with Mr. Anoki should have been the night that Mark should have won the TV championship. Uh, this, yeah. Um, a week or so before, we were at the CNN Center doing promos, as we used to do a lot of on a Wednesday. Mark came and asked me for the TV championship because he was going to do, because he was on this thing that I did with Mr. Anoki. Right. There's only persons that people that knew about it were the Japanese side, Eric and me. Right. Sure. So Mark and I said, I'm sorry, you, he said, I said, oh, can I ask why? And he said, yeah, because I'm getting the the championship uh, at this next, I, I forget what it was, what we did, the thing with the, the angle with Mr. when Mr. Nogge came, I came into the ring when they were honoring him, before the match I had. And I said, I'm sorry, you can't. I said, and, and then Ric Flair was there and he was the, the, the booker. And he said, well, I said, you better go and talk to Eric. I'm not going to tell you know again. You, I'm not going to say anything. It's not. It's. I'm, I've been told to keep this quiet. He went away. Rick, went, whether he called him or when went over, he used to have to go across the CNN Center and up into a different tower to to WCW. I don't know what happened, but he came back and, and said, "Oh no," and we've gone into that on the a different podcast where. The part of the deal with Mr. Anoki was he wanted to wrestle and beat in an untitled match to do right. this deal. A w, uh, but he'd also pick me because he wanted the, to beat somebody of the mythical Lancashire style. Well, Mark wasn't too happy about that. And so when we had this match, um, on the night and I told him not to shoot something. There was a few words said afterwards. Then I, I, I go off to, I do the match with Mr. Anoki. Right. I am. Um, because after losing the title, that's right. when you, you head off. Right. Right. To, right. I, but I, I do the match with Mr. Anoki. I'm still the TV champion. Um, and then the following thing, whenever it is, that's when I drop the, 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 the TV championship to Mark. But Mark was told that he was going to get it on the night that I did the actual angle in the ring with Mr. Noki when he was sat on the front row. So there's that's a story that nobody nobody has ever heard before or knows. I that Mark should have got that that championship on that night that I did the thing with Mr. Noki, but I knew I couldn't because of the the, the match I had to have with Mr. Right. Noki. 
and then the following time that's when my so when you, whatever it is telling me you'll find that that is after i did the match with mr and elk well that brings us to the close of this episode and that's a great story to close it up with of course we kind of glossed over a couple of things we're going to talk about next time we talk about the dv championship matches with brian pillman matches with larry zabisco and uh you're gonna have to wait for that because we're gonna do it next time we talk about the tv uh title which will be not too long in the future next time you see us or you hear us on the gentleman villain podcast with mr regal thank you very much for listening thank you